Okay, excellent. Thank you everyone for joining. My name is Medea Khan. I'm a real estate salesperson working across the greater Toronto area, helping clients buy, sell, lease, and invest. I'm also a real estate investor myself. I like to empower my clients through education and providing value. One way I do that is with a series of free webinars with industry experts to learn all things real estate topics. A few housekeeping items. Like I mentioned, this uh, um, interview is going to be recorded. Please mute yourself for the duration of the call. And if time permits, we will have some time at the end for question and answers with our industry expert today. We're aiming for one hour of your time. Joining me today is Anna of Advertax Law, an expert in tax law. We have a few topics on the agenda to discuss with Anna today. So welcome, Anna, and thank you so much for being here. Uh, hi, everyone. Thank you so much, Madiha, to, uh, for having me here. It's, it's, as always, it's a, uh, it's a pleasure to be part of your webinars. Excellent. So Anna, where hottest topic in real estate right now with from a tax perspective is the recent announcement of the federal budget, the 2024 federal budget with capital gains. So just to start off with what is capital gains? I did some research and this is the definition. A capital gain is the increase in value on any asset or security since the time it was purchased. And it is realized when the asset or security is sold. So in this case, from our perspective, it would be the asset that we're dealing with is property, which could be a cottage, your second home, investment, or rental property. So Anna, if you can wa walk us through what is the change with respect to capital gains in the recent announcement of the federal budget? Um, just to back up a little bit, I wanted to provide just a little more context on what capital gain yeah. is. Capital gain is hopefully a gain. You can also have a capital loss, but let's assume it's it's a gain that we realize when we dispose of capital property. Capital property in very simple terms is the property you hold long-term usually as an investment. It's not the property that you buy and sell as when is inventory quickly as part of your business. It's property that you purchased and you hold long-term. Uh, now you can trigger capital gain through something we tax lawyers call a disposition. That disposition can be real, i.e. when you go in the market, I call my DHA and ask her, help me sell my house. That's real disposition. There's something uh, also called a dean disposition. That's when you didn't really sell anything, but the law will say, even though you didn't, you didn't sell anything, we will deem you to have sold your property. And therefore, if, if there was any gain on the sale, we want to tax you on it. So we have real disposition, we have deemed disposition. And capital gain, we calculate as the difference between your proceeds of disposition, i.e. your sale price in most cases, um, and your uh, cost. Your cost is usually your purchase price. You can also adjust it in certain cases, and you get to deduct your disposition expenses. So in very simple terms, you purchase your condo with Madiha five years ago for uh, for $300,000, now it's worth $700,000. You sold it, you realized 400,000 of capital gain. Now, until the budget announcement, and uh, these rules are still in effect now, this was it, the proper tax treatment of that gain would be as follows. So we bought the condo for 300,000, we sold it for 700,000, the difference is 400,000. So in under the current rules, we would take one half of that gain, i.e. 200,000, and add it to our regular income. So let's say if Madiha is earning a salary of $100,000, we would add 200,000 of gain to her income. So her income, the the total income would now be 300,000. 100,000 is her regular salary, 200,000 is one half of the gain that she realized. 
and she would be taxed on three hundred thousand uh, dollars based on the rates of the province when, where she resides. So these are the current rules. I uh, uh, but in the federal budget uh, proposal, it was announced that the government proposes to increase the inclusion rate for capital gains. So in my example, re remember how we took $400,000 of capital gain and we only included one half of it to your income. So the proposed rule is to include 66% um, or two thirds to your income. Uh, now there are exemptions, there are exemptions. So for individuals, for individuals, the first $250,000 of, of your gain will still be subject to the old inclusion rates. So in my example of the condo where your um, um, uh, in, in my example of the condo when your gain was 400000 the first 250000 of the gain will be subject to the old inclusion rates and 150,000 of the gain will be subject to the new inclusion rates. Uh, in very simple terms, uh, under the old rules, the maximum capital gain rate would have been around 26, 27%. Under the new rules, the maximum, the maximum capital gain rate would be around 35%. So we're looking at roughly 8% tax hike on the gain in excess of $250,000 for individuals. For corporations, so let's say, well, you know, five years ago, um, you came to me and you said, and I'm really worried about exposure to liability from my contractors, my tenants, and, and, and you know, neighbors and such. And I said, well, you can put your condo even in a corporation, in a holding company if you want. If the tax treatment will be somewhat similar, close, not identical, but it will be similar, but you will have uh, additional limited liability protection if that's what worries you. So if you did that five years ago, now the entire capital gain, $400,000 is proposed, um, the, the, the tax hike will apply to the entire amount. So individuals get that first $250,000 exemption from the new rules, corporations don't. Corporate, for corporations, all the capital gain is subject to the new inclusion rates, i.e. 66%. So that's the proposal um, that was announced um, in, in April. And the effective date of the proposal is, uh, well, actually, uh, I should also explain that the draft rules that would govern the law if it comes into the effect are not released we don't have the technical rules, the actual language of the legislation that would allow us to help our clients and you know do the planning and uh, calculate different outcomes. We don't have the draft legislation, but the budget language does say that the new rules, if enacted, will apply to all uh, capital gain realized after June 25th, 2024. So we have roughly, what, uh, five weeks, uh, six weeks until the new rules will kick in. We lawyers, accountants, we don't, haven't seen the new rules. And um, and we uh, have to answer our clients' questions on what are they supposed to do before June twenty fifth. So this is the fun the fun environment we live in. Well, on our end, um, Anna, the June twenty fifth deadline. If someone's trying to sell their property, it's a little bit unclear whether should they have sold and closed before June twenty fifth. Like, Closing is the important date. Yes. Right. 
Well, you know, if we're talking, these are, this is not your principal residence. This is your second property or your investment property. And for, if it's your investment property, likely you've got a tenant in there. So it is really hard to sell a tenant in property to begin with. Um, you have to give your tenant 90 days notice if you're planning to sell your property. That doesn't fit in this timeline of June 25th, right? Like that's quite impossible to do. So they've really not allowed people to make any informed decisions or practical decisions leading up to this June 25th deadline. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. No, it, it, it's, it's, it's a, it's a strange situation that, uh, uh, that, that prevents advisors from doing their job. It prevents advisors from efficiently helping people. And we've lived through something very sim similar when we try to advise people on uh, underused housing tax. I, I you may recall from last yeah. year when we had the deadline and people paid all kinds of money to their advisors to file the returns. Then the deadline was canceled the day before the uh, the deadline, and uh, and then the rules were changed. Um, and, and then we had a deja vu of that situation with bare trust rules uh, earlier this tax season, when again, uh, a lot of money, people spend a lot of money on accountants, tax lawyers, trying to comply with the rules, only to find out very shortly before the deadline that the rules won't be in effect this year. Um, and uh, if I were to guess, I think this is something similar we're living through uh, for the capital gains, except that uh, in the previous two examples, people had to worry about compliance, filing returns. But this situation requires people to actually take significant steps, either sell their properties, or you know, ask their tenants to leave, or you know, do do something that will have cost and legally significant tax uh, implications, and we don't even have the rules to advise our clients on how to do that. So that that's um, you know, that's why I love my job. Uh, never a dull moment. <laughs> no, so. And uh, the government will have us believe um, in the budget release and in um, marketing videos that w the prime minister has done that this is only affecting 0.13% of the wealthiest Canadians. Uh, now, I understand if, for the example you used earlier, if I have 100,000 income and I sold uh, something in a, uh, my investment property and my income that year is 300,000, that for that tax year, my income is higher. So mm -hmm. every year or whichever year I choose to sell my investment property or my cottage, that tax year, my income is higher and it can be significantly higher. So what is your perspective on the government's take that it's only really affecting that small population of uh, uh, you know, small population versus it could be anybody who's realizing that uh, tax gain in that tax year? I have doubts. I will preface by saying that I'm not an economist. I'm not an expert on government statistics. But uh, this is what was available to me from the open sources online. Um, I believe Remax at one point uh, published a report. And in accordance with that report, um, approximately 4.4 million of Canadians held um, a secondary property, be it a cottage or an investment condo or, uh, you know, an investment property of any kind. So in addition to their uh, primary home, their principal residence, they also held another property. Given the average prices of real estate across Canada, and especially in Toronto, Vancouver area, um, I would imagine that the gain on those properties, if held long enough, 
would be higher than 250,000 that still exempt. So yeah. right away, you know, we have what is what is it, 38, I think, million of people living in Canada right now. Uh, and 4.4 of them have uh, more than one properties that can be exposed to these new rules. And I think given the average prices in Canada and the gain that that the real estate market has been enjoying over the last, what was it, 10, 20 years, it was a very healthy state again. I think that a lot of these people out of 4.4 million of Canadians will be affected. Yeah, I, I don't know the the entire like I I didn't I call them and ask what is your gain higher than two hundred fifty thousand dollars or lower than two hundred fifty thousand dollars, but my guess is for for Toronto for, for Toronto area Vancouver yeah. area, a lot of them will be affected a lot for a lot of them, um, uh, their gain will be higher than two hundred fifty thousand dollars. Also, don't forget people who live uh, in rural areas and let's say have a farm, right? And they have a farm and they do have their, they don't, they didn't, uh, they are not part of the statistics because they don't have a second property. They just have their, um, their home on a farm and their farm land. So the principal residence exemption would only apply to uh, the land that's required to service their home, their house. It won't apply to the service of their land. And there are certain ex exemptions available to certain farm and farm businesses, but if it's just the land that the person holds, the same applies to them. So if they were to sell that land, they're caught. Now, another fact that makes me doubt that statistics, the government number of 0.13%, I looked up the average size of an estate in Canada. And I, uh, again, uh, I, I didn't investigate the, uh, the, the numbers, but what I see is that at least 10% of Canadian estates, and just to make it clear, this is this the the value of your property at the time when you die. So, you know, uh, as Canadians pass away, they leave their estate to their children, to their um, okay. uh, to their estate, uh, and the value of that estate, at least ten percent of Canadian estates the value of it is higher than $1 million. These are the numbers that I've seen. Wow. So, and remember how we talked about deem disposition, capital gain tax will apply on the value, on the gain um, of any, on any accrued gain uh, on the value of your assets as of the date of your death. So even though you just died, you didn't sell anything to anyone, this is one of those fake disposition, dim dispositions that exist in law. The government will say, even you, you didn't sell anyone anything to anyone, you, you just died, we want your tax. We, we want your estate on your behalf to pay the taxes, capital, ta capital gains taxes. So again, uh, ten, at least 10% of Canadians, at least 10% of Canadians, uh, will be exposed because the value of their estate is a million dollars. This is a, just the stats that I've seen. It's way more than $250,000 that's exempt or not, rather not exempt or subject to the old rates. Um, and uh, my guess is a lot of those people uh, are also affected. So I don't believe the 0.13% number just based on a, a quick Google search that was available to me, we have a lot of people who hold uh, more than one property. We have a lot of people who live in rural areas and uh, who have owned parcels of land. We have a lot of people uh, with um, larger than like large, you know, 
relatively large estates. And, uh, and it just happens that these people are not really wealthy millionaires. They may have, they, they, most of them are hardworking Canadians, uh, earning an, a modest income, paying taxes, working their entire life. Yes, you know, they may have received a parcel of land from their family, which was worth, you know, 50,000 20 years ago, and now it's worth half a million. Right, but they they were working very hard their entire life. They're not, <laughs> they're not uber wealthy. They're not millionaires, gazillionaires, and maybe that 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 parcel of land uh, is the only chance for them to to help their kids yeah. uh, buy their own first home uh, with the current crisis, and uh, now they're seeing tax hikes of eight percent on the value of the estate and uh and uh my heart goes out to people who chose to have their retirement savings in the real estate right instead of having let's say an rsp portfolio they chose to invent and invest in real estate well uh now the, the reality is uh they're they're you know a retirement fund just got 8% smaller. Congratulations. And that's also on capital gains for stock investments as well, right? It's it applies thing. for uh, the capital gain. The new pro the proposed yeah. rules will apply to uh, any type of capital gain, regardless right. of the nature of the assets being sold. The beauty of the stock portfolio is that you have control over how much capital gain you trigger every year. So let's say if you know that $250,000 of the gain is subject to the lower rate, you generally, I mean, unless the market dictates otherwise, but it's generally open for your planners to not trigger more than $250,000 of gain per year so that you take advantage of the lower rate. They can control how much of your stock they get to sell, right? Um, a lot of times. Or for uber wealthy, you know, they don't have to control or they may not care. But with real estate, if you held your investment property and now you're ready to retire and you want to sell it, you don't get to sell it in portions. You have to sell it. And when you sell it, you don't get a choice to trigger under 250 or more than 250. You just trigger it all and you get hit with the tax. Yeah. And that applies to regular people, regular investment uh, investors, uh, regular people who had their retirement savings in real estate. Yeah. Um, and you mentioned capital loss. When does that occur? And what's the definition of capital loss? Capital loss is the loss you realize as a result of selling your capital property. Let's say, for whatever reason, you bought your condo uh, at the peak of the market. I think it was February 2021. Correct me if I'm wrong, when the prices went a little yeah. crazy. So let's say you bought it for $700,000. Right now, the price came down to Six hundred thousand dollars. I don't know if it's the numbers are even realistic, in, 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 but I'm making them up. So, uh, one hundred thousand is your capital loss in my example. So, the treatment of it for tax purposes is is that you get to um, then use it to reduce your capital gain, either prior capital gain or capital gain that you realize in the future. So if you we combine the two examples, let's say, you know, one condo we we um, uh, we had a, a capital gain on one condo and capital loss on a different condo. So uh, you get to offset your capital loss from that February twenty twenty one COVID condo that we sold at a loss to reduce your capital gain from your other condo that you sold at a very healthy gain. And sorry, does that have to be the same year? It doesn't have to be the same year. 
there are rules that allows you to carry back or carry forward your loss to a different year. The, uh, what you cannot do is you cannot use that loss to reduce your income from other sources. For example, you cannot reduce your salary to say, oh, you know, I didn't, uh, or you cannot reduce your income from business. You can only reduce your capital gain. Okay. Um, th so that's one way to be exempt from capital gains is from this, your sale of your principal residence. So currently, the sale of your principal resident is exempt from capital gains. Has there been any change on that or any proposed change coming? Uh, no, despite, uh, uh, despite the rumors that we've been hearing for the last, I want to say, five or six years, yeah. uh, it looks like the government is not brave enough to take away the, the, the favorable tax benefit of Canadians yeah. uh, as of now. Uh, but... Um, but the, the 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 capital gain inclusion uh, change uh, will affect people mainly people who had their investment uh, real estate investments in corporations without any warning before it didn't matter how you hold it it was you know it, 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 these people generally would be just ended up on being unlucky because they chose this structure they didn't do anything wrong right. they weren't wealthier than everyone else they didn't make more money they they didn't they weren't trying to fool anyone they just simply added a corporation to the structure to allow to provide for some limited liability protection now their tax will be significantly higher so uh, another category of people who are affected by the rules uh, are people um uh, who had, like I said, their retirement savings right. in the real estate. Uh, and they're they're forced to, you know, the only reason for them to get their money, their retirement money, they have to sell real estate. When you sell real estate, you trigger this huge gain and you get taxed on it. And um, the estates. So uh, this is going to sound, you know, strange but dying before june 25th 2024 uh, and i don't even want to continue the sentence but but the the message i'm um, trying to deliver is that canadian estates after june 2024 will have taxes may have may end up with with tax rates eight percent higher uh than before june 25th uh, 2024 and uh, and that affects all the gain in excess of two hundred and fifty thousand mm -hmm. dollars uh and if you if you believe the statistics it, it's a significant number of potential Canadians of, of the states that will be affected after June 25th. So um, you'd have to do some really efficient tax planning. So it's not necessarily beneficial to have your investment properties in a corp right now, given this new tax environment, right? And it's not easy to unwind. Yeah. And if it, it's even harder to unwind as we plan in the dark. So that's how right. I explain my work to clients. I say, I will do my best, but just you, so you understand, I am planning in the dark. I don't know what the new rules will look like. I may do something and the new anti-avoidance rule will cancel what I'm trying to do. I have, I don't have a crystal ball. I don't know what they're going to enact. So right. that's what we're dealing with. Um, and how did we get to that first 50% that's currently the ta uh, capital gains tax inclusion rate? A government, this was a hike from an original one. And the reason I ask this is if there's a new government coming, could not that I want to give us false hope, but could there be a possibility that the new government reverses this? And has uh, that happened in the past? 
I, I, I would hope so, uh, but before, uh, before we think that far ahead, um, uh, so to answer your question, yes, I think this is a possibility um, to even enact the change. Uh, uh, as we're, I'm talking to my colleagues, uh, tax accountants, tax lawyers, we all um, we came up with a very very long list of other rules in the Income Tax Act that also need to be completely reworked and amended because of this proposed change. Just to give you an idea, I'll show you the Income Tax Act. So it's this. <laughs> And now that's not it, it, this. So this is the act, yes? So if any of you like reading, uh, you know, Russian classics, The War and Peace, uh, if you remember the book, it's three times the volume of The War and Peace by Tolstoy. <laughs> and uh, if a lot of sections in this act will have to be completely redesigned, reworked, and changed okay. to fit the proposed rules. So um, I, uh, I don't know how long it's going to take the government to rework all these rules, to redraft them, and then to enact them into law. Uh, some of my colleagues advise their clients to basically do nothing in anticipation of June 25th deadline because their view is that what the government proposed is it's, it's not going to become like even if it ever becomes the law, the effective date cannot be June 25th. That's their view. Again, they don't have a crystal ball. They don't have an insight into the government and, and, and the Minister of Finance. That's the government um, minister in charge of drafting the rules. That's their view. That's the view they take. That's what they advise their clients. So it'll, it'll be interesting. So we talked a bit about the principal residence and sales currently are ex uh, exempt from the principal residence. And this question comes up a lot with my um, clients. Is there a hard and fast rule? And this is probably also for investment properties. Um, I know there was this anti-flippers law that came about. Is there a rule on how long you keep your property before you trigger the CRA as a flipper on either side, your principal residence or your investment property? Um, you right. It's a common question, and uh, uh, and there's a lot of miscommunication and misunderstanding uh, around that one year rule. The general uh, rule of thumb is this: if you're selling your property after holding it for less than one year, guaranteed that's bad. Less than one year, guaranteed, equals bad. Any property, your home uh, or your investment. Any property, unless you can show uh, that you sold it as a result of uh, uh, certain life events. And the law includes a list of those life events that the government deems a valid excuse as to why you sold your property so quickly and those events include a divorce you know a job relocation generally very serious reasons for selling something and and also these are also reasons that are usually well documented and you can't really play around with them and say oh yeah it's i i you 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 can't really um uh, be flexible with your reasons. Either you sold the house as a result of your divorce or you didn't get divorced. So we, what happened? So if you sold your property after holding it for less than a year, guaranteed this is bad. If you sold your property after holding it for more than a year, 
it may be still bad or may not be bad. So let me explain. So the anti-flipping rules only apply to properties held for less than a year. So if you hold your property for more than a year, means you out of the anti-flipping rules, but you are into general rules. And the general rules basically say that if you sold your property, um, if your property was your business inventory and was not your capital property, was not your principal residence, then you're a flipper. So even if you held your property for 13 months, 14 months, 15 months, a year and a half, even sometimes two years. But let's look at your history. What do you do for a living? Or oh, I am a construction worker, or I am a real estate agent, or I am, uh, you know, somehow connected. I'm a developer. And how many properties did you sell before? Four properties in the same manner, buying living there for a year, selling it, buying, living there for a year, 13 months, 14 months, selling it. This this uh, hop, hopping in between houses, the court calls this pattern house hoppers. And they say when you're a house hopper, you're just hopping in between houses, you never really plan to live there. You never really plan to hold it as a new investment. If you never really plan to hold it as your investment, it was your inventory. You know, just as if, if you sell selling widgets, your home was your widget. You were also you only always wanted to flip it. You always wanted to resell it. You may have moved in, moved down. We don't care. It was your inventory. So um, a lot of people get this false uh, sense of security. Oh, I held the the condo for 14 months, I should be okay. My answer is not necessarily. You may or may not be okay. If you held it for 14 months, but you also had five other condos in the same way, and your business is somewhat related to real estate or construction, chances are the CRA will go after you, even if you held it for 14 months. So it's important to remember under a year, bad, over a year, maybe bad, maybe good, depending on the facts. Okay, great. Um, there was also some recent changes on rules for short-term rentals that any um, the certain number of days are changing that you can hold it or you can only have um, a short-term rental property within your principal residence and not as your investment property cannot run as an Airbnb. If you're making profit from your short-term rentals, how is that calculated from a tax perspective and any rule changes on that recently? Um, so there were changes that's related to uh, using your, that were proposed on using your, um, uh, on uh, your property as an Airbnb in the areas where it's not allowed. Um, I, so the changes uh, so proposed to disallow your expenses. Uh, so that's that's one change that's that will be interesting to follow. When it comes to Airbnb, the uh, the important consideration is this: if you are using um, your property uh, primarily for your Airbnb business you in for some serious tax implications. So my message to my client is always to carefully watch how often and how extensively you use your property, your principal residence or your investment property for Airbnb. If it's an occasional use with the cottage, you know, for a few months over the summer, a few weeks, just to help with bills, I don't have a problem with that. But whenever that use, either, you know, when you look at it time in terms of timing, you know, the, the overall period when the cottage is available for rent or to to for to for to occupy, 
if um, if more than half of that time the cottage is used for Airbnb rentals, you're looking at serious income tax and uh, HST also implications. I would encourage everyone to see their tax advisors, especially and ensure that your tax advisors are very familiar with the so-called HST change of use rules. Um, and, uh, and, and, and before they uh, continue that business. So just to uh, make it clear where I'm going, you by using your property, your otherwise your otherwise um, otherwise uh, personal or investment property, by by using it as by uh, starting to use it as Airbnb, you may inadvertently trigger tax HSC in the amount of. 13% of the value of your property. So imagine the property, the value of the property, uh, calculate 13% of that. That's your potential exposure if you don't do a trade. Yeah, so uh, whenever, I, I know that it's tempting, especially a lot of people, in, in, you know, purchase cottages over COVID, and now they want to go to Europe, they don't want to go to their cottage, so they put it on Airbnb, and they make money, and everyone's happy. I'm happy, too, as long as, you, as long as you speak to someone about your exposure to HST risk, both on the change of use, and later, when you're ready to sell the property, you may lose the principal residence exemption, if it was your principal residence exemption, you may lose the capital gains treatment if it was your investment property, and you may get hit with a massive, massive HSC um, uh, implications uh, that are just not fun to dispute with the CRA if it becomes a real problem. Speaking of HST, Anna, I work with a lot of pre-construction investors. And for these investors on closing, because they declared this condo as an investment property, they're required to pay HST to the builder, which is around $24,000. Mm -hmm. and, and there is an HST rebate component. And from our understanding, you have to get a one-year lease in order to um, pay uh, apply to the CRA for this HST rebate. Now, because given the current environment, a lot of investors are now thinking, I want to get out of this, but I, I can't assign because the assignment market isn't that strong. So I'm going to close and I'm going to uh, sell. So can you confirm, Anna, that you really do need that one year lease in order to apply for the HST rebate? And if you, after leasing it for one year, and you, you did touch on this earlier, are you and you decide to sell it in the resale market, you've closed it, you own it, you've rented it for one year. Is that still flipping? <laughs> okay. Um, so yes, one you do need the one year lease. Absolutely. Uh, something else that I wanted to add that relates to a pre-construction market, that one year clock that I was talking about, remember less than when we, one year equals bad. Yeah. That one year clock resets on closing. Oh, so, so it's not occupancy. No. Wow. So you may hold your, you may purchase your condo, you, you may sign your agreement of purchase and sale in 2014, for all I care, mm -hmm. right? You may then wait for the occupancy until 2022. Then you, then you may get your occupancy, get your tenant in, rent it for two more years, and finally you have your closing in 2024. That's when it's rules starts. will still deem you a flipper if you sell within less than a year after closing. I don't have any exceptions available to you unless you have, you know, those life uh, um, life events exceptions. So uh, I, I wish I had better news. Yes, hold it for a year. Yes, hold it for at least a year to avoid anti-flipping rules and to avoid and to get your HST rebate. Okay. 
Um, we are almost 10 to uh, one o'clock now. So Anna, thank you so much. This would always a pleasure, always something really great to learn about real estate and taxes. And I'm glad you read those fun books and don't leave it for us. <laughs> <laughs> thank you, Anna, for your time. But well, if you ever have insomnia. Um... <laughs> yeah, that's right. <laughs> uh, I'm going to open it up. If anybody has any questions um, that for Anna, feel free. You can write it in the chat or you can unmute yourself and um, ask if you'd like. We'll wait a couple of minutes for that. Okay, and if not, well, thank you so much, Anna. Was there anything else you'd want us, um, your last tips of advice on the taxes coming or tax year 2024 or something you're seeing from your clients top of mind for them? Uh, I just see, uh, I see a lot of uh, wealthy, wealthier clients um, live in Canada and that makes me sad. Yeah, I've been in practice for um, counting now 16 years uh, and I haven't seen this trend until now. Uh, a, a lot of some of it is connected to post COVID world and um, and people becoming more mobile. They don't have to be chained to their desk on Bay Street to but it's to do their work or they don't have to be um they don't have to be in canada they can be on the beach they can be uh you know in 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 anywhere they want uh and uh on just as people found this freedom to work from anywhere they want and live anywhere they want uh, we're seeing more and more pressure on uh, uh, put on Canadian taxpayers, especially the wealthier Canadian taxpayers. And I do agree that wealthier people should bear more, uh, should pay higher taxes. Uh, at the same time, there's a line. Uh, and, and at one point, uh, people say enough is enough. I will pack up and I will leave uh, in uh, Portugal uh, on the beach and uh, maybe take advantage of some tax incentives they offer or, or Panama provides a very attractive uh, tax uh, um, holiday uh, to new uh, residents or there are, there are a number of countries around the world that will uh, offer tax, tax incentives. Uh, and, uh, uh, and even if we look south of the border, it's an hour and a half drive. In Buffalo, people pay taxes at a much lower rate. Uh, so I think that uh, as much as we all love Canada, uh, the government needs to understand that you can put too much pressure on wealthy Canadians in post-COVID remote digital world, your wealthiest, your most talented people will leave. That's not a good situation. No, and it's de-incentivizes people to set up business from an entrepreneurship perspective. And that also includes like um, professions that are incorporated, like doctors and some lawyers or accountants and, you know, We've always struggled with brain drain, but it's a de incentive of making money here. True. Well, we as lawyers, we only know Canadian law, so we're safe. The government can do anything they want with to us. All right. But, <laughs> <Don't fight back. laughs> but uh, for doctors, for IT professionals, especially, they don't have to be in Canada. And a lot of them are upset. Uh, no matter how many times you repeat that it's only 0.1% that's been affected by yet another tax hike, they don't like it. They don't like it. They know that they can get a way lower tax rate just an hour and a half drive from here. Uh, so we'll keep that in mind. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Anna. Thanks for your time. You're welcome. Thank you for having me.
All right. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining. Thanks. Bye.